I was excited to be the last talk today because I know we always talk about moonshots in the uh, Web3 community. So I'm actually going to be talking about the moon today. Uh, in particular, I'm going to talk about uh, space as a commons. I'm going to talk about lunar internet. And I'm going to talk about the importance of time. So first, I just wanted to pause and say, what do we mean when we say that space is a commons? Um, we've talked a lot here about the ways in which commons are, commons are not legally defined, but commons in, uh, in space uh, have many of the same qualities uh, that we talk about. We talk about public goods on Earth and we talk about common pool resources. So in 1967, something called the Outer Space Treaty was signed. Uh, the Outer Space Treaty was a Cold War artifact that came out of the United States and the USSR, who were both worried that each other would claim the moon as territory when they got there first. And so uh, this treaty is, has a really important tenet in it. Article two of the Outer Space Treaty says that there shall be no national appropriation in outer space by claim of sovereignty, by means of use or occupation, or by any other means. So I think this is really interesting because it basically means that the entire universe, minus the Earth, which is not covered by the Outer Space Treaty, is essentially an area that is called, in international law, uh, an area beyond national jurisdiction. And this means that the normal rules and regulations and coordination mechanisms that we tend to use here on Earth uh, don't apply. So we have this sort of like, this, this vast expanse, literally, uh, of, of a commons, and we need to figure out how we're going to govern that. And it's not just a general challenge. The, uh, the moon and exploration in general is an area that is receiving a lot more attention um, recently. The, the, um, NASA has something called the Artemis program, and uh, it has been putting billions of dollars into uh, lunar exploration. Uh, the moon is the closest celestial body to us, and so it kind of makes sense that even, you know, whether we go onto Mars or other planets, uh, that we're going to be looking at the moon first. We also have, as uh, David was also just talking about, we're seeing uh, not just reducing launch costs, but we're seeing many aspects of um, technology miniaturization, uh, standards and new approaches that are letting us um, accelerate and grow space activity. And that's happening not just with governments, but it's also happening with commercial companies. So not only do we have uh, not just the big space players, we have small countries getting involved in space exploration, but we also have private, the private sector as well. So this is just a slide from NASA showing uh, a lot of the activities that are planned for the next 10 years or so to give you a sense of the fact that uh, it's not just sort of like one mission every once in a while, but we're really talking about um, roughly 10 missions a year that are planning to go to the moon uh, over the next decade. So this is kind of a, a sea change. It's like a categorical change in the amount of activity uh, that we're seeing uh, in space exploration. And even though it doesn't seem like a lot, each of these missions, especially the commercial ones, are actually kind of like uh, nested Russian dolls of activity because when they're commercially run, um, what, you, what you often have is you've got a launch vehicle from one country and then you've got a spacecraft built by another country, maybe a commercial company. Then you've got payloads on that spacecraft uh, that are themselves from different operators and actors. And so you have this whole ecosystem within the spacecraft itself. Uh, and that raises all kinds of questions about governance. So for me, when I talk about space as a commons and in the context of this conference, uh, the reason why I think it's so interesting is kind of a, a double whammy, if you will. Uh, one is that I think there's this opportunity to ensure that space itself stays as a commons. Because just because we have a treaty, uh, treaties as we know, treaties fall apart sometimes. People uh, walk away from treaties. And so even though we have this lovely framing, uh, we need to figure out how we're going to implement it if we want it to stay true. The second is that uh, we can use space, and of course the moon in particular is what I'm talking about today, we can use space uh, to prototype approaches to commons governance uh, that we don't have an opportunity to, uh, or we're not in a position to do right now here on Earth. So I work with an organization that's called the Open Lunar Foundation, and we are the only organization in the world that's dedicated to uh, good governance and setting positive precedents in the lunar domain. 
we do this primarily through looking at uh, public utilities for the lunar environment. And uh, we've been talking about public goods here. Uh, public utilities tend to be a little bit more applied and operational, uh, but, but I think it's the same basic uh, motivation for why we're talking about public, public goods here and why we're also excited about it. Um, public utilities, they provide value and they help to level the playing field for all actors so that we can see a, a wider ecosystem of activity. It also helps to address the risk of monopoly and ease international cooperation. But it's also a, a chance to bootstrap governance in the lunar environment. Of course, since we don't have a government, uh, we need to figure out how we're gonna make decisions, uh, who, who gets to participate in those decisions, uh, how people get in, how people get out, uh, what the break is, what the institutions are. And then finally, as I just mentioned, there's lessons for global commons here on Earth. Uh, we have, of course, um, you know, big international commons governance challenges around the internet, um, around climate, around pandemics that we haven't uh, exactly figured out how to govern well. So one of the big areas that we have uh, worked on, uh, I'm gonna go through this slide quickly because I don't have that much time, but um, is resource management and property rights. And uh, this, as we all know, the state is typically uh, the way that uh, property rights regimes are managed here on earth. And given that the moon and, and beyond are areas beyond national jurisdiction, we can't just rely on state enforced property rights regimes. And so again, just like in web three, we need to figure out how we're going to, like what is the basis for property rights regimes? Uh, but the area that I am going to go into in more detail uh, is lunar communications. And, um, you know, the backdrop is, as we've all been talking about, that uh, we are seeing more and more the failure modes of the internet uh, here on Earth today. Uh, we need innovation around protocols and around the architecture itself of the internet. Uh, yesterday, Divya was talking about positive sum public goods. And the internet, of course, around the moon could also be an opportunity to set up a positive sum um, dynamic that will be uh, offering services for data relay, but also for something called positioning, navigation, and timing, or PNT. Yeah, PNT is what will allow us to operationalize coordination, uh, transparency, and something that's called situational awareness. So, just to give a little bit more context for the uh, in sort of introduction of lunar communication services that are being discussed right now. Uh, in the lunar community, uh, back back in the day, you know, we had big and expensive missions. Uh, they were uh, on what's called the, the near side of the moon, uh, so they had direct line of sight to the Earth and could just communicate directly back to ground stations here on Earth. Um, they were, you know, maybe going every few years. That's probably even generous. Uh, we haven't had missions to the moon in the last couple of decades. Uh, leading up to uh, just a few years ago. There's like this sort of like um, chasm of lunar activity, if you will. But now what we're seeing is that um, NASA has something called the CLPS program, the Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program. Uh, and these are, this is uh, NASA funding for commercial missions that is giving like roughly $100 million to um, two missions a year to go to the moon and take commercial payloads with them. And so it has this nested Russian dolls effect that I was talking about before. Uh, and we're also seeing that missions are planning to go to the uh, far side of the moon, which means that they won't have direct line of sight back to the earth. And so they need to have communication relays to get uh, their data back to, to us. So um, as, as you could expect, uh, one-off communications infrastructure is quite expensive. Um, and it's also gonna provide limited coverage. coverage. You can only uh, provide, um, uh, you know, you you can only provide coverage to where where your beam width is going to reach to from the orbit that you're in, and so you're not going to get uh, the entire celestial body all at once. So obviously, with more users coming into play, uh, you're starting to see the benefits of networking uh, be discussed. Uh, right now, there's a few different programs going uh, going on. Uh, NASA has a program called LunaNet that is looking at standards and, and architecture for lunar lunar networking. Uh, ESA also has a similar one called Moonlight, and China is also um, starting to demonstrate uh, relay ca uh, capabilities uh, in something called uh, L2 Lagrange point near the moon. So governments are starting to work on this, uh, and, and there's a question about how the kind of community is going to respond. So some of the considerations uh, and the conditions for lunar internet, uh, one is that we've got small n. It's not a big ecosystem right now. It's uh, gonna be a small and uh, slowly growing number of nodes in this network. 
Uh, the second is that it's, a, uh, it's gonna be dynamic coverage. All of your nodes are moving. Uh, you've got, you're gonna have likely, especially at the beginning, coverage gaps. There's, there's no equivalent of geostationary orbit around the moon. Uh, so you're, there, there are what are called frozen orbits, there are stable orbits, uh, but they're always gonna be moving relative to the surface of the moon. <clears throat> and so this means that there are many considerations for constellation design and orbit selection uh, and trade studies that need to be done. Uh, some of the interesting, like more technical, <coughs> excuse me, challenges uh, that I just wanted to highlight. I mean, there's lots, but uh, I wanted to pull out a couple. Um, one is routing. Uh, in an environment that is inherently wireless, uh, the, the routing protocols that we use, uh, there's an opportunity for them to look very different. Uh, as I mentioned, mo nodes are mobile. Um, so are we gonna use uh, distributed hash tables? Are we gonna create mesh networks? Uh, maybe we can use IPFS. I know that Falcoin has an experiment uh, that they're gonna be running with Lockheed Martin in the next few years. Um, the other is something called delay tolerant networking. Um, this is a, a standard that a set of standards that have been developed to support networks that have uh, disconnections uh, at various points. And so you need to sort of like, uh, you need to hold your data at intermediate nodes and be able to forward them opportunistically. Uh, the lunar environment is sort of a hybrid because um, it actually is, it's only about a second and a half away. And so it, you're not gonna break TCP uh, to do, if you wanted to use IP around the moon, if you have continuous coverage. So there's just a bunch of design considerations that will influence um, you know, how these things play out. Uh, that has implications for naming identity and trust, uh, which, which I think is something that this community is very interested in. And again, it's just an opportunity for us to say, what are we learning in this environment and how might we wanna set up different ways of doing these things in the lunar, uh, in the lunar case. So I just wanted to make the point that uh, it's not that this is, this isn't sort of like mysterious, this isn't unsolvable, it's, it's just a lot of work. And the point is that those who show up are gonna be the ones who um, draw on both the values and the technologies that they know, uh, and they're gonna be the ones that are setting the precedents. And this is all happening against the backdrop of um, geopolitics. We have you know, major national rivalries right now between the United States and China, uh, defense interests and commercial competitors, which mean that the basic uh, concept of relaying traffic for each other isn't sort of uh, a foregone conclusion. And so the concern is that we see, like a, uh, we see um, just sort of like a transformation of legacy systems into the lunar environment and that we end up with a tragedy of the commons. So given this, uh, what Open Lunar has been working on uh, is a service that underpins all of, uh, all of these communication services and the missions uh, that are operating, which is posi uh, positioning, navigation, and timing. Um, and this is important for what's called transparency and confidence building measures. Uh, so giving, giving the international community shared history, a shared version of truth of who did what, where, and when, um, and that has follow-on implications for uh, liability, due regard, and who eventually uh, will be entitled to certain claims as and if we create property rights systems. So as most of us probably know, um, position is inherently a function of time. When we use GPS uh, here on Earth, we need at least four satellites that are in view. Those satellites need to know where they are. Uh, and those the GPS satellites get their time uh, from uh, terrestrial standards from terrestrial clocks that are very advanced atomic clocks uh, that are averaged across many different sources. And in the um, lunar environment, there are no clocks. We don't have clocks yet. Uh, so we don't have a lunar time standard. Um, we don't have a common reference for satellites in lunar orbit to get the time in order to be able to tell their clients, if you will, where they are. And telling time is a function of uh, several different things. Uh, it's the hardware that you choose, and that has implications for the, um, the sort of like the tick rate and the drift of your clock. Um, your, your clock has to synchronize usually with another uh, sort of more authoritative time reference. Um, and then you have to figure out how you're gonna distribute time. So what protocols you're gonna use to give time to other spacecraft in that environment, uh, and then how they're gonna give it to their clients. And finally, you need a reference frame uh, in order to uh, make sure that when you say what, uh, what, when your clients are calculating a position that they're using the same reference frame that you are using to know what position you are in. 
And finally, I think one of the most exciting things about clocks is that it's an opportunity for an apolitical time standard. Uh, on Earth, I mentioned that GPS satellites get their time reference from uh, assets on the ground. Uh, GPS is the American uh, navigation and positioning system. There are um, what are called GNSS, Global Navigation and Satellite Services, uh, from other countries, all of them use their own time reference. And those time references in all of the major systems are provided by the military because the military needs to know uh, what time it is in order to know where its weapons and uh, major assets uh, are in the event of conflict. And so uh, on Earth, our time standards all go back to, uh, to military systems. Uh, but on the moon, there's an opportunity that if we were to put a clock into orbit that is an independent time standard, that we could have the first uh, apolitical time standard for the solar system. And I think that's really exciting. <laughs>